Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the Dickey Center, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, talk uh, by Fred Wary on sectarian politics in the Gulf from, Iraq, from the Iraq War to the Arab Uprisings, which is the title of his brand new book published just last month by the Columbia University Press. Now, um, uh, we're fond of saying here at the Dickey Center uh, that uh, a particular visitor couldn't be more timely. Um, this time it's especially true. Uh, it, is, um, it is an extraordinary moment in the history of the Persian Gulf and, all, and the broader Middle East. Um, the Iraq War, as we all know, lifted the lid off a lot of suppressed sectarian animus in the Gulf, and we are still getting a sense of the real magnitude of the consequences of that episode. Um, just last term when we had the noted Middle East scholar Mark Lynch here, we talked about how the uprisings of the Arab Spring also seemed to lift, if I can use the same metaphor, uh, the lid off autocracy and the vacuum uh, that was created was filled not by debates over forms of government, but in so many areas by sectarian strife. And of course, in the worst instance of all of this, uh, we saw the developments in Syria, uh, where there is both a real civil war going on and a proxy sectarian conflict uh, between the two uh, great, the Sunni powers of the Gulf and, and Iran. So to, um, use a, to, to invoke a historical uh, precedent, it seems like there is a whiff of 1979 in the air. Um, at that time, we had the Iranian Revolution and a Saudi uh, slash, if you will, Sunni counter-revolution that um, led to a great deal of Salafi activism and uh, a kind of Sunni expansionism, and we are still living with the consequences of that. Now, sectarianism doesn't come out of nowhere. It's, uh, there are forces here, images, arguments uh, that are invoked by governments and by others to manipulate the situation, and so it's vitally important that we be able to dig down and try to understand how events are being shaped, and there's no one who could uh, do this better than Fred Weary. Fred is a senior associate in the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He um, focuses on political reform, security issues in the Arab Gulf states. He is also one of the leading experts on Libya, and I hope that uh, after uh, he speaks to us about the Gulf, we can uh, uh, pry some insight about Libya out of him. Uh, his um, recent Carnegie publications include The Struggle for Security in Eastern Libya, The Precarious Ally, Bahrain's Impasse, and U.S. Policy. He knows a great deal about the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, which is uh, Shia-dominated, and he has written about that as well. He's had an, a, a very impressive career for someone so early in his uh, scholarly production. He was, um, he was a senior policy an analyst at RAND. He's also a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. Uh, he completed tours in the Middle East and uh, North and East Africa. He testifies regularly before Congress uh, on, uh, on a range of issues, and I'm pleased to say that he was a central participant in the Dartmouth IISS conference we held last September on the Muslim Brotherhood and the Arab Spring. He has a doctorate from Oxford, as well as a degree from Princeton, which we won't hold against him. And um, he has uh, written in virtually every major um, uh, elite publication, uh, as well as um, such, uh, such outlets as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, uh, and many, many others. It's wonderful to have Fred here. I should say, just in closing, he's one of the few people who I offered a job to who didn't take it, who I still really like. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Fred to uh, Dartmouth. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Dan, and thanks to the Dickey Center for the, uh, for the introduction, for the, for the invitation. Um, one of the things I really admired about Dan and, and why I almost uh, took that job uh, was this ability to, uh, when he was working on terrorism and extremism, to, to peel back the layers of, this, of larger narratives, uh, to get at the root causes 
of what's happening, the underlying political and social forces that drive uh, extremism. And, and today, uh, in this talk, I want to peel back the layers of another affliction that is rattling the Middle East today, and that's tensions between Shias and, and Sunnis. Now, as Dan mentioned, if you've read the headlines, it would appear that sectarian strife, this, this tension between these two sects of Islam, is all the rage, so to speak, in the Middle East. An ancient festering hatred, it would seem, between these two sects is throwing the region into this Dante-like inferno. Obviously, the epicenter of this is Syria's ferocious civil war that has spilled over into fragile Lebanon, into Iraq, and the combatants in all of these theaters seem to be arrayed along sectarian lines. And of course, the, the region's two main superpowers, Iran and Saudi Arabia, are on either side of that divide. They're egging on the combatants, they're funding them, they're pouring fire on the pyres of sectarianism. Now, as Dan mentioned, this narrative, this script, uh, is not new. We've seen it before. Back at the, at the height of the Iraq War in 2006, when, when Iraq really exploded into sectarian strife. And then, as he mentioned, even before that, in the wake of the, the 1979, uh, Iranian Revolution, which brought to the fore, for the first time, a Shia power in the Middle East that had expansionist designs that was bent on toppling Sunni regimes. Now, if you read a, uh, an article in the New York Times about two weeks ago, it, it surveyed much of this chaos and it made the argument that, that what is making sectarian strife even worse today, the moment that we're living in, is the vacuum of American power. That the Americans are nowhere to be seen and that Americans have typically acted as referees in this region, keeping the combatants apart. And because we're not there, it's only going to get worse. I'm going to argue today that this lens, this reading of the map, this very simplistic yet compelling reading of the map along sectarian lines, Shia and Sunni, these two colors on the map, dark green, light green. This is green, by the way, because I'm colorblind. It is. It is. OK. That's why I have trouble with, with maps. Honestly, I really do. It's amazing the Air Force let me in. But uh. So anyway, dark green, Shia, light green. Sunni, this, this idea of dividing maps along this, these, these schisms is, is very compelling, but it's ultimately simplistic and wrong. It doesn't get to the root causes of why these identities come to the surface. Why do Shia Sunni identities matter in the first place? Nowhere is this more evident than in the countries, I think, in the Gulf that I study that are the topic of my book. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait that have significant Shia populations. President Obama, in his uh, address to the United Nations, attributed Bahrain's violence to sectarian tensions, which is very interesting because this is sort of like describing the symptom without actually getting at the root cause. What's fueling those sectarian tensions? So I'm going to argue that focusing on this Shia-Sunni split conflates symptoms with root causes. It ignores the role, or the agency really, of political actors in manipulating identities, as Dan mentioned. You kind of gave my talk for me, by the way, but that's all right. Um, and, and also, I think, more importantly, institutions. Let's get back to institutions in this region when we talk about identities. Governance, ways of including people, ways of giving them a voice in their governance, and reducing the appeal of those identities. And perhaps worst of all, when we read the region along these lines, when we talk about Shias and Sunnis that are fighting each other, that plays into the hands of authoritarian rulers who have always used this idea that the, this region is made up of people who are antagonistic, who are tribal, who are susceptible to, to sectarian passions, and the only thing keeping a lid on it is a strongman iron rule. Rulers like Saddam, like Assad, and the, the countries that I talk about in my book that happen to be our allies in the region, the monarchies of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, and Kuwait. And this, these are the countries that I'm going to focus on uh, today. 
Now, I think we can all agree as students of international affairs, no matter what region you, you study, that identity matters. And certainly in this region, sectarian identity matters. This split between Islam, uh, it, within Islam, is significant over succession to the Prophet Muhammad. But, and over the centuries, this schism has manifested itself in rivalries between empires, beginning in the 1500s when uh, P Persia, under the Safavids, was converted to Shiism, again, giving the Shia-Sunni split an ethnic dimension for the first time, Shiism being associated with an ethnic uh, power in the region. Also, class. Historically, the Shias have been the underclass of the region. Um, but we can argue that, like any other identity, it's been, it's coexisted or it's been subsumed along other identities, national, local, class, urban versus rural, ethnic, tribal. Sometimes ideologies in this region have tried to subsume sectarian identity. Many uh, communists in Iraq, for instance, were Shia. Some early Ba'athists were Shia. In times of crisis, when the state breaks down or the state fails to deliver services to its citizens, these identities come to the surface. Elites, whether political or religious elites, exploit it for self-serving ends. Deprived of a safety net, citizens latch onto these identities and at times, people will kill and die for these identities. But I'm going to argue in this talk that the antidote is not necessarily a referee, a greater power, keeping a lid on all of this, whether it's America. We have to remember that the last wave of sectarianism occurred at the height of the American occupation in Iraq in, in 2006. Nor is the solution a truce between the two sectarian heavyweights in the region, Iran and Saudi Arabia. This has been put forward that if relations are eventually healed between these two contending powers, might that lower the sectarian temperature? I think it will lower the temperature, but it's a mistake to think that these two powers are like puppeteers that control the region's Shias or control the region's Sunnis in these different countries. And I'll get into that um, uh, in, in a bit. And of course, it's certainly not a return to authoritarianism. Because as my book argues, sectarians' roots are ultimately local, in institutional. It's woven into the political fabric of the region. And it's a product of longstanding policies of exclusion and repression that make people re revert to these identities in the first place. And this is especially the case in the three countries that I talk about in the book, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait. In, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in the eastern province, the Shias comprise 10% of the population. They're concentrated, importantly, in the oil-producing area of the country. Um, and historically, they've suffered from a range of grievances and discrimination that I'll get into. Uh, Bahrain, the Shia are a demographic majority, 70% of the population. In Kuwait, uh, they're 40%. They're Obviously, these states are of, of significant importance to the United States. So if we want to put on a security lens, when we talk about sectarianism in, in this region, the Gulf is a good place to do that. Um, obviously, a country that I've written on is Bahrain. The US has a major military presence there in the form of the Fifth Fleet headquarters. It's important for projecting naval power uh, into the region and containing Iran. There are real questions after the Arab Spring about the, uh, the durability of the Al Khalifa, about the legitimacy of our association with that regime, and about the long-term, I think, stability of, of the country given that demographic majority. Now, the Shia populations in each of these countries were inspired by the Iranian Revolution. When it happened, they looked at it as a model for emulation. And Iran did try to export the revolution to these Gulf states. And there were active cells in these Gulf states that were trying to work against the regimes and trying to, to overthrow them. But in the 1990s, there was a rapprochement. There was a change in Iranian policy, a change in leadership. Iran pulled back from trying to export its revolution to the Gulf. It adopted a good neighbor policy. 
in the Gulf while at the same time still trying to project power into the Levant, into Lebanon with the creation of Hezbollah, backing Hamas. But the Gulf was sort of seen as almost an off-limits area. There was, a, there was a, an improvement of relations. The Shia, for their part in the Gulf, severed their ties with Iran and began working within the system to get rights. The Gulf regimes responded initially favorably. They made promises of reform. Um, there was sort of this handshake uh, notion. And throughout the 90s and up until the turn of the millennium, there was this real sense of, of hope among the Shia that their rights would be acknowledged, that their sect would be acknowledged. But what happened really around 2003, which coincidentally was the start of the Iraq War, is that these promises were not kept, reform backtracked, things got worse for the Shia. The cosmetic reforms that were set up in the, in the Gulf, meaning these parliaments, these consultative councils that were set up to include the Shia, didn't really amount to anything. They didn't actually legislate, they didn't actually produce anything, and you had this real sense of rising resentment among the Shia, especially among Shia youth, and that crescendo, that reached its peak with the Arab Spring, which is why people say, well, the Gulf wasn't really a part of the Arab Spring. The Gulf is somehow immune to the Arab Spring because of its oil wealth, because of its small populations. That's true to a certain extent, but if you want to find where the Arab Spring actually impacted the Gulf, Look at the Shia populations, because they are not part of that ruling bargain that has historically defined uh, the, the states of the, the Arab, uh, the Arabian Peninsula. So you did have uprisings in these states. Many of them were not well covered by uh, the media. There was an uprising in eastern Saudi Arabia. Uh, 16 people were killed. Violence continues to simmer there today. In Bahrain, the death toll is over 70. This was the real significant one, um, to the point where it required a Saudi military intervention. The Saudis sent troops into uh, Bahrain, which is one of the few actual military deployments of, of a Saudi force into another state. And it just shows you the extent to which the Saudis were determined to crush this uprising and prevent the Arab Spring from reaching the shores of the Arabian Peninsula. Fast forward now to the, the war in Syria. This is, this is really the new wave of sectarianism uh, in the region. These Gulf states are active players uh, in the region, in, in Syria's war. They're funding the Syrian opposition. They're funding Salafi Sunni actors that have a definite anti-Shia bent. And that foreign policy is inflaming regional sectarianism that is in turn coming back and crashing over the Gulf and affecting domestic politics in the Gulf in very um, subtle ways. So again, what I argue in the book is to understand sectarianism, we shouldn't focus on this notion of, of differences in religious sects. We shouldn't focus solely on external regional factors, but rather the interplay between regional factors and the domestic context local governance, institutional discrimination, the absence of participatory governance, democracy, these are things that, um, that inflame sectarianism. Let me, um, let me continue um, and, and talk sort of about the, the regional waves of, of sectarianism that we've seen uh, in, in the Middle East. Uh, and then I'll talk about how Arab commentators have diagnosed sectarianism. I, I think it's important to lend an Arab voice to this and to say that that Arab authors in editorial columns are intensely aware of this phenomena of the Shia-Sunni split, and they've tried to diagnose it. Uh, and it's, I think, very important to, to listen to those voices. Uh, and then I'll talk about politics within Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait, really getting at the roots of why the Shia-Sunni split there has become so inflamed. Um, and then I'll, um, I'll wrap up with some thoughts about uh, policy implications that we can cover in, in the uh, in the, uh, the question and answer, um, in the question and answer period. Um, again, I think we can start out with sort of a broad brush 
observation about the Middle East, about the nature of cross-border identities, and the notion that what happens in one corner of the region is amplified and echoed in another. Because people have an affinity to tribe and sect in different places. This is partly due to the weak nature of national identity, the artificial border, borders of these states. But what's interesting is that recently, and actually around the time of the Iraq War, around 2006, perhaps a little earlier, you had the explosion of social media, you had the explosion of, of YouTube, and this lent an immediacy to sectarian strife in the region. People in this region became real-time participants in conflicts that were happening in another corner of the Middle East. Uh, and I talk a lot in the book about the role, the, the interplay between media and sectarianism, and especially Twitter. Twitter has a way of, of sort of uh, equalizing sectarian discourse, inflaming um, sectarian strife, and regimes in the region are, are really wrestling with the explosion of, of, of sectarianism. Um, obviously, I think the first wave, as, we, as we've mentioned, was the Iranian Revolution. And again, I want to emphasize to you that when I talk to uh, elites in the region, especially Sunni elites, officials, they read what's happening today through the lens of the Iranian Revolution. Many of them came of age during that momentous event. It was an earthquake, a regional earthquake, on multiple levels. Obviously, as I mentioned, the fact that you had a revolutionary power in the region that was bent on eradicating monarchy in the region, and that was a Shia power. But more importantly was the notion that here was a strong U.S. ally that enjoyed significant U.S. support that was suddenly and violently overthrown, whose leader went into exile, and it caused a lot of these Gulf regimes to really question the, the durability of the U.S. security guarantee, and we see that obviously uh, today, and we'll talk about that um, later. So again, what did the Gulf states do? They, they kicked into high gear. They began countering Iran on multiple levels. They backed, of course, Saddam Hussein during his, his bloody war with Iran. But at the ideo ideological level, at the level of media, at the level of discourse, they began trying to counter Iran's spread of Shiism by mobilizing Sunnism, and in particular, mobilizing Salafism. And we can really date, I think, the, the emergence of a particular form of Salafism to this Saudi counter-reaction. Uh, and again, what you find today is that many of the anti-Shia texts that are being used in the Gulf are recycled texts that were used in the aftermath of the Iranian Revolution to discredit Iran. Um, the second wave, I think, was obviously the 2003 Iraq War, where you had the overthrow of a Sunni bulwark against Iran, Saddam Hussein. The rise of Shia political actors suddenly came to power uh, through elections. You had the reemergence of Najaf as a center of Shia learning. Then the descent of Iraq into civil war. The 2006 Lebanon War was another uh, earthquake in the region that magnified sectarianism. This is where Hezbollah uh, had a remarkable battlefield performance against the Israeli Defense Forces. It, it, it escalated Hezbollah's popularity throughout the Arab world. This was a Shia power that was taking on the Israelis. This, again, brought sectarian differences uh, to the fore. And post-2011, again, I'll talk about the way the Arab uprisings acquired a sectarian hue, and now, obviously, Syria is, is the latest um, wave. Let me talk about how Arab commentators have, have diagnosed sectarianism. And here I'm talking about writers within the Gulf. Writers within the Gulf adopt a very common tendency for human beings and governments when they're faced with some dilemma or affliction, that's to blame somebody else, to, to cast the blame outward. And what you find in their writings is that sectarianism is really the product of Iranian state policy, Iran's meddling in the societies of the Gulf. That were it not for Iran's policies, were it not for Iran's nefarious designs on the Gulf, Sunnis and Shias would live in harmony. That Iran is the one that is stirring up uh, the Shia, 
that is plotting against the Gulf. Hezbollah is implicated in this, setting up cells. So is Maliki in Iraq now, and of course Assad. What you find remarkably in Bahrain is the Bahraini regime, senior officials in the Bahraini regime, arguing in interviews that the uprising that Bahrain is facing is a form of retaliation by Assad, that Assad is the one that's stirring up the Shia as a retaliation for the Gulf's involvement in the Syrian war. And this is a remarkable, almost fantastic uh, linkage of, of events, but it just speaks to the way that they, they externalize uh, sectarianism. Um, the, other, the other interesting argument that you find in the Arab press is that sectarian division, sectarian strife, is a product of U.S. policy. That it's an imperial project by the United States to weaken Islam, to weaken the Ummah, and to divide it in order to better rule it. And this, again, is very remarkable. But if you've traveled to the region, conspiracy theories flourish there. It's a fact of the region. Um, and what a lot of these authors do is they latch on to, frankly, marginal articles that will appear in op-eds by scholars that are not connected with the US government, but that get taken as gospel, as US policy. And sometimes you'll see these articles appear that will argue the U.S. needs to help withdraw, redraw the Middle Eastern map because it's artificial, these borders are colonial, we need to remake the region, and we need to remake it along sectarian lines. And these articles get picked up and people say, aha, the U.S. is, is out to change us, it's out to divide us. So again, the U.S. is a factor in sectarianism in the minds of, of many. Uh, other people talk about uh, the differences within sects, in, in each sect. Um, they talk about reforming Salafism, that there's something about this interpretation of Salafism that has sectarianism in its DNA, that is anti-Shia, and they talk about the need for reforming it. Other people throw the lens on Shiism as a, as a practice, and they argue that the, this notion or this, this institution in Shiism of the marja'iyah, meaning an external source of clerical authority, meaning Shias in different states will follow a cleric that resides outside those states, that that creates sectarian tensions because it calls into question the loyalty of Shias, the fact that they obey somebody else outside the country on religious matters. So these are notions that, that they need to reform the uh, religions themselves. But importantly, and this is my point for, for the book, is that very, very few people talk about political institutions. They don't blame sectarianism on government policies. They don't give agencies agency to rulers themselves. And I think this is where we need to shed the light if we really want to talk about why Shia Sunni identities come uh, to the surface. Let me move on to that, that topic and talk about what we see in the Gulf uh, in terms of, of policies that fuel sectarianism. I think overall the fact that there's a lack, a democracy deficit in the Gulf, that there are, is a lack of popular participation in government, allows people to revert to these, these identities. The problem in, in many of these countries, in places like Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, is that you do have some sort of quasi-democratic institutions. You have uh, municipal councils, you have parliaments that are set up but they don't have real power. They can't actually call the government to account. They can't actually legislate. So what happens is they become infected with sectarianism. And you find uh, in a place like Bahrain is that a lot of the, par the parliamentarians spend a lot of time trying to mark t their territory along sectarian lines, trying to demonize their, their opponents, also trying to sympathize with what, with what is happening outside their borders in places like Syria or Iraq because these institutions are really artificial constructs. People talk about them as debating societies. They don't have real political authority. They're not truly uh, democratic institutions. The other, I think, um, driver behind sectarianism in the Gulf that, that often gets overlooked is questions of land ownership, provincial discrimination. Much of this informs the way 
Shia in the eastern province view their situation. The eastern province historically was underdeveloped. The municipal councils don't have authority over their budget. When they look at the wealth of, Shi of Sunni villages nearby, there's a tremendous dis uh, disparity. So again, sectarianism has been institutionalized in terms of the way land is distributed, the way land is uh, developed, uh, and this really uh, inflames it. We can go on across the board in the Gulf, the labor market. Certain labor, uh, uh, sectors of the labor are off limits for the Shia. Uh, unemployment is exacerbated among the Shia. Uh, government ministries are off limits. You find Shia in token positions in uh, ministries that, that may not have a lot of power, like the media or communication, but never in the ministries of interior, never in the judiciary, never in the defense or foreign affairs. The security forces in the military, this is a key one. This is absolutely huge. If you look at a place like Bahrain, why did Bahrain, why was Bahrain able to weather its uprising? One reason obviously was the intervention of Saudi Arabia, but more importantly, it had a loyal security and military force. This is, the, the, I think, the common denominator across the Arab Spring, if you want to understand why regimes fell or why they didn't. Look at the loyalty of the, the security forces. The security forces in Bahrain are overwhelmingly Sunni, but more importantly, they are, they're, they're, they've been brought in from outside the country. They're imported. They brought in foreigners from Yemen, from Syria, from Pakistan, they've given them uh, naturalization. And this creates really sort of a janissary core. I mean, this, this idea that the Shia are being ruled over by, by foreigners is, is quite, uh, quite significant. And it's a huge grievance when you talk to Shia in Bahrain. The notion that they don't have participation in their own military or security forces. Same thing in the eastern province. The police in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia are all Sunnis from elsewhere in the country that have no connection to the land that they are supposed to be uh, policing. Education as well, this is a huge complaint. Textbooks in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait uh, are influenced heavily by the Salafi religious establishment. When I talk to Shia, they say, I'm sending my kids to school. Why should my kids be taught that their religion is heretical? And in some cases, that, that adherents of their religion deserve to die. I mean, this is the sort of thing that infects the education system uh, in, in these states. This, the cultural and the religious sphere, in terms of Shia mosques being built, uh, places of worship, the funding of religious endowments, different courts for Shia law, all these things across the board fuel uh, sectarian uh, discrimination uh, in the Gulf. But let's talk about media as well. An another uh, grievance in the Gulf is the idea that the Shia are subjected in the media to excessive attacks and vitriol. Much of this was at one time on television and in traditional media, but now with the explosion of social media, Twitter, Facebook, it's gone to a whole new level. And again, it has the effect of magnifying what's happening in the region. So what happens in Iraq, what happens in Syria with sectarian fighting there gets magnified on social media and reverberates across the Gulf. Uh, and it really, I think, has a, has a toxic effect on politics uh, in, in, in the Gulf. Regimes are really struggling with this. Um, some states like Kuwait have taken steps to curtail it. Um, they've, they've made it a criminal act on Twitter to insult another sect, to attack another sect, to defame another sect. But guess what? They've also used this as cover to enact very draconian censorship laws about criticizing the ruling family. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, the Saudis have not policed Twitter to the same extent. Twitter still remains um, unpoliced. Um, we see a lot of these Gulf states trying to muzzle clerics that make sectarian attacks. This is, in some sense, a good, a good development. But again, at the same time, they're depoliticizing them. These clerics cannot talk about politics at all. They can't critique the ruling family. They can't talk about Syria or what's happening in, in, in Egypt. 
Let me um, say some things about the way the Shia in these Gulf states have, have adapted or have tried to press for their, for their rights. What's interesting is that in the wake of the Syria conflict, we know that Syria has been a magnet for Sunni jihadists from not just the Gulf, but from across the region, from Libya, a place I've been to, uh, as far away as Central Asia. The appeal of, of these Sunnis, helping their Sunni brethren, has been, um, has been I think, seismic. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a real magnet. What's interesting, what is an interesting difference from the Iraq War, though, is I think regimes like Saudi Arabia uh, have learned their lesson and they've been clamping down on clerics that are actively calling for vol Sunni volunteers to go fight in Syria. When I was at the height of the Iraq War, I was watching a number of these Sunni clerics that were calling for Saudis to go fight in Iraq and kill Shia. Those same clerics uh, two years ago were trying to set up fundraising drives to raise money to go to Syria, uh, and they were shut down. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't volunteers going through. There's certainly money. There's certainly volunteers still flowing through. There's certainly charities that are not under the control of these regimes that are getting through. Many of them are going through uh, Kuwait, which has very loose uh, financial controls. But by and large, I think some of these Gulf states are quite worried about uh, the boomerang effect of having Sunni jihadists go to Syria, uh, fight, and then possibly come back. But what's interesting is what about the Shia? We know that the Shia from Iraq and Lebanon, obviously Hezbollah, Iraqi militias are going to fight in Syria, but have we seen the Shia in the Gulf volunteer to go fight in Syria? The answer is no, not yet. Why? Because they still feel that they have a vested interest in these states where they reside. They still feel like they should work within the system. But what I'm going to argue is how long is that going to last? We've already seen in some of the, the media forums that I've been following questions, people asking questions in web forums that are associated with very moderate Shia political parties about why shouldn't we go fight in Syria if all the Al-Qaeda are going, if the Sunnis are going. But by and large, the Shia are still trying to participate in this national project which is very interesting because many of the Shia in the Gulf have strong ties to Syria. They studied there at, at some of the seminaries. They received safe haven there during the 1980s when they were cast out. Um, but by and large, you don't see them uh, actively um, going to fight or even sympathizing with, with Assad. An exception to that, though, is Kuwait. Again, Kuwait, you do have Shia figures that are sending money to Assad militias, that are supporting Shia militias there. Much of that has to do with historical reasons, again, the ties of those Shia to Syria, and also the very loose controls of the, um, of the Kuwaiti uh, regime. But I think, again, I think this, this notion that the Shia are not actively side, taking sides in the Syria conflict speaks to the larger nature of the way the Shia and the Gulf have pushed for political reform. What you find is they don't necessarily demand rights as minorities. They're not necessarily pushing for concessions to, to the Shia as Shia. But what are they calling for? They're calling for democracy. They're calling for things that are shared by other activists in the Gulf. A constitution, judiciary reform, the release of political prisoners, these are not necessarily grievances that pertain specifically to the Shia, but they affect the entire Gulf. And what you find is many of these Shia are trying to build bridges, establish links, establish coordination with other activists, other Sunni activists, elsewhere in the kingdom, elsewhere in the states. So you have Shia activists out here in the eastern part trying to meet with Sunni liberals out here in the west. And guess what? For the Al Saud, for the ruling family, that's tremendously disconcerting. Because what's their worst fear? Is that all these disparate elements in the kingdom are going to coordinate their activities and form an, a united opposition front. And so what does that mean? It means that regimes 
that these Gulf regimes, again, have an active interest in promoting sectarian divisions, in, provo in promoting sectarian di divides, to prevent oppositionists from forming links. What's the best way to prevent those links from happening? Portray the Shia in your media as being subservient to Iran. Portray them as being Iranian agents. Try to spook the Sunnis. Try to create divides within the opposition. And so this speaks to this argument that sectarianism, again, and I talk about it in the book, has been a very useful ruling strategy for Gulf monarchies. And what's happening throughout the region helps in that strategy. When I was visiting Saudi Arabia in 2007 at the height of Iraq's civil war, when Shias and Sunnis were at each other's throats, when tribes were fighting, there was this notion in Saudi Arabia that maybe now is not such a good time to go down the path of democracy, to have elections. Because guess what? If you have elections, you get what, what was happening in Iraq. This is what the Al Saud are trying to sell, this notion that, yes, you may have grievances with the monarchy, but the monarchy is really the glue that's holding this country together. Do you really want to try to see what could be next? It could be far worse. So again, this notion as of the monarchy as these arbiters of society that are keeping uh, the society together, I think is a powerful strategy that we need to recognize uh, in, in the Gulf. And again, it's designed to stave off demands for popular change, for revolutionary change, for democracy. And you find this narrative in the wake of the Arab Spring. This notion and, and the Gulf media outlets will say this, that what happened in Egypt and Tunisia were real uprisings. Those were, those were real democratic uprisings. Those were popular uprisings. But guess what? What we have out here in the Gulf is different. It's sectarian. It's, it's sponsored by Iran. It's meddling. It's completely different. Ignoring, completely ignoring the fact that the Bahraini uprising was directly inspired not by Iran, but by what was happening in Tunis and Tahrir Square. Again, trying to shift the narrative to, uh, to a sectarian one. So let me conclude with some thoughts. What we've seen, again, is that sectarianism is a product of political actors rather than an immutable feature of this region that has existed without change for centuries, that is the product of, of ancient hatreds. Sectarianism is invoked, it is pervade, it is peddled, it is inflated. We see it happening, this, this narrative happening now within the Gulf by these regimes who are in some cases exploiting what's happening in Syria. They're part of what's happening in Syria. But I'm going to argue that this is a, a very, very dangerous strategy. It's a Faustian bargain. Because once you open the can of identities in this region, you never know what it could create. Let's remember that Al-Qaeda, as an ideology, as a movement, thrives on, anti on sectarianism. And I think you're really playing with fire when you try to manipulate and open these, uh, these identities. These states are our allies in the region. We are, in some sense, dependent upon them for, obviously, oil, for the free flow of oil in this region, for the containment of Iran, for projecting American power in the region. But at the same time, we need to understand what's happening inside their societies, inside their states. And this notion of the Gulf as these rich monarchies where all the citizens have it good, these gleaming cities, these gleaming um, outposts of modernity, needs to be questioned. There, are, there is real tension beneath the surface. We can have an entire, entire different discussion about the question of Saudi youth, about the youth bulge in, in these places. But there are a lot of phenomena uh, happening uh, beneath the surface. Again, so let me, let me close with, um, with, with a plea, really, that, that for you as policymakers, we need to avoid slipping into a sectarian narrative, as, as I think President Obama inadvertently did when he talked about Bahrain, of seeing this region um, as, as sort of being locked in sectarian strife and, and looking at Shia-Sunni conflict as the main driver, but rather get to the root cause. And the root cause really, I think, is the absence of inclusive government, the
the absence of a pluralistic political culture that recognizes identities and includes them into the process. I had an activist once tell me in the Gulf that giving people a voice in their government, giving them a stake in their government, is the best way to inoculate them against sectarianism, against being susceptible to sectarian strife that could emanate from outside uh, their borders. I think this is sage advice, uh, and I think it really um, needs, uh, needs heeding. Again, this notion that politics matter, that it's not simply the immutable hatred between two sects of, of Islam. So with that, I'll stop, and we can, uh, we can turn it over to, uh, to questions. What's that? Are the questions? Yeah, if you want, sure, yeah. All right. Fred, thanks very much for a great uh, tour of a dismal horizon. Um, <laughs> and uh, with that, we'll open it up to the floor. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll take the, uh, I won't open it up to the floor yet. I'll ask the first question. Um, Syria. Um, <clears throat> You know, there's one, there's sort of an argument that, um, that Syria is payback for, for the Sunnis losing Iraq. Right. And um, that suggests, you know, a very narrow, uh, very, yeah, right. um, <clears throat> well, almost juvenile worldview on the part of some of the rulers in the region. And I was wondering, um, and, and, you know, callousness, given the hundreds of thousands of people have now lost their lives, but I was wondering if you'd like to address how they're viewing the conflict in Syria and what it is they're thinking as they're pumping the, the in. The states? Yeah, as they pump in the money. Yeah, well, I mean, again, I think um, to look at why the Saudis have stepped up their involvement in Syria, you have to go back to their, their geopolitical struggle um, with Iran that I think really picked up with the, the election of Ahmadinejad and with the, you know, the sort of reassertion of, of Iranian power um, throughout the region. Um, I think ever since, well really, uh, I guess since the fall of Saddam, there was this reassurgence. But then the Saudis got, got dealt a number of blows in this, in this, in this conflict. Um, 2006, the Lebanon War, you had a, a, a proxy group that was backed by Iran that suddenly took the reins of the Palestinian cause of the Arab-Israeli cause, that historically the Saudis have prided themselves on, on being patrons of the, of the Palestinian cause. Suddenly you had this, this pro-Iranian group get all the limelight, that they really stole, stole the show. That was a tremendous blow to the Saudis' prestige. You had in Lebanon, Hezbollah come to the fore. The Saudis' clients in Lebanon were, were defeated uh, in 2008, were really dr uh, run out of town. In a number of other areas, there was this sense, uh, I think, um, in Saudi Arabia that the, the, the entire balance of power in the region was shifting to Iran. And then suddenly Syria happens. And the sense in Saudi Arabia is that Syria is the entire, I think, epicenter of this larger struggle with Iran, and that Syria represents a prime opportunity to, if not bloody Iran's nose, then perhaps even deal a fatal blow to Iran's influence in the region, clip Iran's wings in the Levant, deny it access to Lebanon, chasten it. And, I, and again, I think this is, this is why they're pouring so much money and arms into, into Syria, uh, because Syria is such an important, historically, uh, 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 the, the beating heartbeat of, of the Arab world. And this is really a zero-sum game with Iran. You could argue now that the way the Syrian conflict has, has morphed is that the Saudis are really fighting a three-front war now. They're fighting Iran, but now you have Al-Qaeda rising in Syria. And the Saudis are afraid of the rise of Al-Qaeda that could come back and bite them. So they're trying to support Sunni actors that are opposed to Al-Qaeda. They're also worried, I think, to a lesser extent about the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Syria. They want an outcome in Syria that keeps all these three powers down or out. Uh, and this, again, is a very difficult, difficult balancing game. It just speaks to the incredible complexity um, of, of the Gulf or of the, of the region. For a while, the Saudis were also fighting sort of a proxy war with the Qataris. The Qataris, their, their historic rivals on the Arabian Peninsula, were backing the Brotherhood. There was competition between the Qataris and the Saudis. 
Um, the Saudis appear to have wrested the reins of this from the Qataris for now. Um, but again, I mean, the Saudis, when, when you talk to them, there's this just real palpable sense that this is a, an existential struggle um, to, to really roll back um, Iran's influence uh, in the region. It's interesting because I, I, it reminds me of a, a conversation I had with some Saudi um, think tank scholars in Jeddah. And what was interesting is they had this sort of compartmentalized notion of, of their strategy in the region. They had written off Iraq to Iran. They, they, they said Iran had a plan before the U.S. invasion to assert its influence. It won. It deserves its influence. There was almost this grudging admiration for Iran that Iran worked its plan, it worked, and it got Iraq. So they've written off Iraq. They're not even trying to roll back Iranian influence in Iraq. The Gulf is sort of this tenuous source of tension where you have some almost sort of a modus vivendi in the Gulf with Iran. There are certain rules of the game that are being played. There's tension, but it's a shared piece of real estate in the Gulf. But the Levant, is the gloves are off. That's where you really want to roll back Iran, Iran's influence. So. OK. All right, please wait for the mic. Is that on? No. All right. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Ala. I'm a senior from Jordan. Um, I have two questions. So yeah. first, you described the four waves, and I think they hold largely true at the regime level. At the regime's level. Okay. Right. But uh, do you think they hold as true at the populist level? And I specifically think about the 2006 war with uh, uh, between Lebanon and Israel. And my impression is that the Sunnis were largely very happy uh, at Hezbollah's so-called yeah. victory. Um, my second question relates to the fourth wave. Uh, you described that how the Syrian conflict really inflamed yeah. uh, sectarian conflict in the region. Uh, but as the Arab Spring started, at least, um, as a struggle against corrupt authoritarian right. regimes rather than being a sectarian struggle when it started, do you think it has the potential of transcending the region beyond this sectarian conflict? Yeah, no, those are great questions. Well, again, no, the Lebanon war, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, my, my point was that it, 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 it brought, to the, brought to the fore a sense of, of sectarianism as a dividing line. And, of course, I think you're right. It, it did open up this chasm, really, between the regimes and their people. And so that made sectarianism even worse, I think, for, and especially in a place like Saudi Arabia, because the regime was suddenly realizing that they were on the wrong side of the way the population was, was supporting Hezbollah. And so, again, my point was it, it, it's a divide, but you're absolutely right. It, it sort of lined up differently in terms of regimes and their, and their populations. Um, let's see, with, with Syria, um, yeah, I mean, you look, look, I mean, the, 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 the fundamental divide in the region remains between a vertical one, between rulers and, the, and, and, and their subjects. And, and so in places like... I mean, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Libya, I mean, these are sort of core countries of the Arab Spring. I mean, the sectarian dimension is not, is not present there. I mean, it's, it's, still, uh, it's still waged in, in a sense of, 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 you know, demands for accountable government. I mean, I think you have a real worrisome authoritarian turn in some of these places, I mean, obviously in Egypt. But again, the sectarian narrative is, is only useful in places where you have these identities that are, that are in place, that have been submerged, that are there in the first place. So, I mean, again, in a place like Bahrain, I don't think we can get back to a movement that will, that will be calling for real representative government or that will be framed in terms of corruption because the society there in, in the three years since 2011 has become so polarized along sectarian lines. The, the regime has played that card very well. People are lining up on different sides of the sectarian divide because of what's happening in Syria. Um, you know, you go there. I, I was going there, yeah, virtually every year since 2011. And each time I went, I got the sense that the sectarian divide was worse. Schools were divided. Um, you know, editorial boards of newspapers were divided. Every institution seemed to be polarized. And people were split. So again, I don't. Th once that genie's out of the bottle, it's it's difficult to put put back. So. Professor Carey. Thank you. Whoop. It's, uh, it, it's my perception over the last year or two that uh, the uh, media at Yahoo and uh, 
neocons uh, have actively uh, essentially been, uh, been favoring uh, or less, let's say opposing the Shia much more uh, than the Sunnis. And, uh, uh, and, and yet, if you look at the history, in right. some ways, in terms of where Israel actually stands, uh, and, you know, largely, uh, you know, the threat that said it had to be coming from the other direction. But I just wondered what, do you think this, in fact, has been the case, and, and uh, what would be the factors driving that? Yeah, well, again, no, I mean, I think they're, I mean, it's interesting that, that you know, you have, I mean, this, this happened, I think, you know, three years ago or th two years ago where you had, the, I think it was not, the, a senior leader in, in Israel called Saudi Arabia a moderate Arab state. I mean, this, you have this sudden alignment now of the Sunni reactionary, I'll call them, or Sunni conservative states that at one time were behind the architects of, of Sunni radicalism that included the demolition of Israel as part of their discourse, that these, there's now this convergence because of, of what is happening um, with the Iranian threat. But again, I would argue that much of this is about the perception of, of the vacuum of American power. Um, it's it's a, a marriage of convenience that I don't think will, will last much beyond that. There are a number of obstacles, I think, that prevent real uh, convergence between the Sunni Arab states and, and Israel. But again, certainly you're, you're seeing it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the Israel, again, if the, this, the one state in the region that you know, presents an existential threat to, to the state of Israel is, is the Shia power. So naturally, I think they're gonna think that Shiism is a, is a greater threat. But again, there has not been a Shia suicide bombing in quite some time. Um, you know, it, you can argue on many fronts, Iran and the United States share a number of, of strategic interests. You're certainly seeing that now um, in calls for talks with the Assad government, um, that Iran has to be part of the, the solution. And of course, the, the you know, I mean, the pro-Israel camp is, is opposing that. Um, so the region is, is aligning itself in interesting ways. But again, I think much of this stems from the perception of an American um, vacuum. The Saudis are looking for other partners in the region and externally. Um, they've talked about going their own way now, as you've seen, they've pulled out from the UN. Let me just say a, a few words about this. I mean, the notion of a Saudi-US divorce, that the Saudis are really gonna break from us, I think needs to be taken from, with a grain of salt. The Saudis, throughout their history with the United States, have always been worried that the United States is going to abandon them. They, I mean, when I visited uh, Saudi Arabia in 2007, uh, this was ahead of the withdrawal from Iraq. There was this sense that we were retreating in the region, uh, and they threatened that they were going to seek uh, a partnership with other powers like China, like France, like India. I think if you read the new Gates memoir, Gates actually has an anecdote in that book where he says King Abdullah told him back in 2007 that we're gonna go our own way, we're sick of you as the United States, you're not supporting us, you're not a durable partner. So this narrative in the Gulf that the United States is not supporting them enough, it's, it's being recycled, it's, it's part of the game I think that they play. That's not to say that relations aren't rocky and bad and, and there's significant turbulence, but my point is it's kind of like that line from Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? Who are the Saudis going to call? We're still the only game in town uh, in terms of real defense. We just sold them $60 billion worth of arms. Um, we haven't pulled the fifth fleet out of the Gulf. We've, in fact, just started expanding that. We're still there in the region. So. I sometimes wonder whether it isn't actually a sign of the age of the Saudi leadership that they're starting to repeat the lines the that lines, they, the same lines that they, they yeah, were right, saying right, four right. or five years ago. Right, right. Uh, I'm going to try that again. Professor Carey. <laughs> uh, so your comment earlier was interesting when you were talking about uh, is, is the microphone not working at all? Microphone not working at all? I'm going to lose. Uh, can you hear him? A little bit. A little bit. So repeat the question. Sure. I, I thought your initial comment about uh, you know, sort of picking up spray off ends, yes, right. talking about uh, you know, sort of border ships and so forth, uh, and, and the uh, ruffle feathers in that, in that region. But you know, spray off ends by American writers aside, I wonder if you could comment a little bit 
Um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've had all this news uh, from Iraq and Western Iraq about ISIS sort of declaring the border between Iraq and Syria to be uh, non-existent anymore. And, and uh, you know, right. whether or not they actually represent a you know viable military threat to, to that border, can you talk a little bit about commitments within these countries uh, to the existing borders? And is there any place in the region that you could imagine uh, the, the national borders that are in place now? not being there five right. years or looking different uh, five years from now, 10 years from now. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. No, I mean, the, the issue of Western Iraq and, and, um, and, and Eastern Syria has always been a, an area of loose control. I mean, even, I think, even before the, this current round of fighting, I mean, there was, there, was a, uh, there was an anecdote where a traveler went up to the tribes in Eastern Syria, way up there in the east, and um, this, was, this was, I think, under, under the rule of Saddam Hussein. During, and they said, who's the president of your country? And they said, Saddam Hussein. So they're looking, again, which border are they looking at? They're looking over the border to where their tribal kin are. So it just speaks that this entire, to that notion that that entire line is, is an artificial uh, colonial construct. So, but my point is, okay, you have weak identities, but it's a, quite a leap from that into actual statehood. And so what I think you're going to have is, is again, these no-go zones, these areas of loose governance where, where you know, tribes, smugglers can, can take, uh, take advantage. I mean, again, going back to Libya, I was just there. The entire south of Libya is like that. Gov the government, government control in that region is basically a single minister with a cell phone sitting there, and there's no, and there's no police, there's nothing there. It's, it's a loose confederation of tribes that have loyalty south. But again, how are you going to actually create a state from that? I don't think we're going to see the redrawing of borders. The one place where you will see that or you are seeing that is Kurdistan, I think. And that was happening throughout the 90s. My first career in the United States Air Force was at Adana Air Base in southeastern Turkey, where I was helping with the no-fly zone over northern Iraq which started in 1991, which for over the course of more than a decade, I think, yeah, more than a decade, you could argue created a Kurdish state. I mean, this was, we, we protected this, this area. Saddam didn't have the state projecting, and, and it solidified Kurdish nationalism. Add on top of that oil, and now they've, they've improved their relations with Turkey. You've got the formation, I think, of, of a state there. So that's, I mean, that's where I would see it happening. But, the notion I was talking about is um, there, this, op, this one op-ed that came out in the New York Times talked about a Shia state. They actually used the term Shia stan, which was just incredibly, I think, insulting because, first of all, the notion of a stan is a, is a Central Asian construct. And no, nobody in Arab, the Arab world uses the, question, the, the notion stan. It's, it's from a different language, a different culture in Central Asia. But the argument was we're going to have a Shia stand that's going to be eastern Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, up into Iraq, and then you know, this whole area is going to be a new Shia Arab state. Again, a very simplistic reading. If I'm sitting out here in Washington, I look at this map. Yeah, that makes sense. But you go there and you, you look at facts on the ground. These Shia communities are incredibly diverse. Over the course of... of um, of centuries, they become wedded to their national histories. They follow different clerics in Iraq and, and Iran. They have different tribal lineages. They, it's a long step from that sectarian affinity to draw a map and say that that's going to be a state. So, and this is the kind of, I think, lazy thinking that, that gets the alarm of the region. So. <laughs> Substitute one. Right? Um, could you address um, the U.S. side of this? Uh, and specifically two things. Uh, one is the hard one saying, so what should we do? Uh, <laughs> right. and, the other, and the other one is amongst the American policymakers, how aware are they of the subtleties that you allude to? Sure. And a related issue is how much is this part of our blue-red divide, our own hmm. little <laughs> sectarian, <laughs> sectarianism right. yeah, uh, affecting yeah. rational thought and, and real political decision, <laughs> or uh, real decision making. Yeah, well, again, um, 
Yeah, I mean, what, what to do? I mean, the question always of, of American foreign policy is this, this tension between um, values and interests, between realism and idealism. And, and it's just a sad, I think, fact of life, and I'll be the first to admit it as a scholar of the Gulf, that this, this notion of Shia, of, of Shia rights, of sectarian tensions, hasn't risen to the level yet where it, it acquires this sort of existential attention that, that a busy policymaker um, requires. And so, so again, look at the priorities in the region. It's, it's Iran, 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 containing Iran, and it's counterterrorism. The Saudis, for all of their faults, have been excellent partners with us on counterterrorism, on countering al-Qaeda. And the Gulf states, our military architecture is still embedded in these states in terms of this, this containment uh, structure to contain Iran. We've inherited it from you know, going back to the evacuation of the British. And again, I think the, the inertia of these policy you know, requirements is driving our foreign policy. And, and the notion of, of, of focusing on Shia rights or, or democracy promotion in general, I think, has taken a back seat. And I think much of it also acquired a bad taste from the Bush era, the notion of, of democracy promotion for, uh, for sort of strategic ends acquired a bad taste. Um, oh, President Obama, they just cut the, um, the, the democracy promotion funding. Um, so this, this notion that we're somehow going to take a magnifying glass to the internal affairs of these states and look at Shia rights in, um, you know, in the eastern province, it, it's just, I mean, frankly and admittedly, it's, it's not going to get the attention. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't elements of the U.S. government that aren't working on that. There are some programs. I mean, diplomats are going out there. Um, but what I did, and I actually did this in a paper I wrote um, on the Kingdom of Bahrain, and I think Bahrain presents a unique case, because there, the sectarian dimension does have a realist strategic imperative because of the demographic reality, because 70% of this population is Shia, and how long are you going to keep the lid on that? And what you're seeing now, and, I, and so I framed the, the, the paper in a, in a strategic rationale. I didn't simply talk about human rights and when it's in our moral interest to support this, but rather it's in our strategic interest. We have a base there. And guess what? Some of these protesters lately are starting to target the base. They're starting to associate the United States presence with the regime, with the regime's crackdown. And if we wait too long on reforms, that opposition could turn anti-U.S. You could start having a threat to U.S. assets and personnel. So act now before it endangers you. So there I think there's, there's a strategic um, rationale. But again, it's, it's simply a matter of, of, um, you know, of priorities. Perhaps when the Iran factor is reduced, if there's some sort of rapprochement with Iran, our relationship, the nature of our relationship with these Gulf states may change. I'm not sure how much, again, the, the, um, the oil factor, the inertia of our strategic relationship. Um, but, so. Yes. Uh, on the issue of identities. Yes. Matt, take the mic. The mic. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. On the uh, issue of identities, uh, they're more than just sectarianism. Of course. And right. as, sec as security breaks down in these states, right. tribalism becomes a more significant factor and a more significant identity mm -hmm. than it does during times of peace, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, is, has there really ever been an, an instance of strong identity with state or nation? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I mean, tribe, tribe is obviously one, one layer. I think sectarianism you know, sits atop of, of tribal identity. I think tribes are, are part of sex, but yeah, I mean, tribes are, are what is, um, you know, tribal militias are what's fighting in, in, in Iraq and in, in eastern Syria. Um, so, I mean, yeah, tribe is, is one layer of this, but sect is sort of the, the over sort of the largest common denominator, I think, in, in a lot of this. And, and, I mean, the other thing exacerbating sectarianism is the fact that you have these two states in the region that are that are elevating it right now, um, and that sort of supersedes tribes. No, and look, state identity. Um, Egypt, a cohesive civilization that goes back millennium, you know. Um, Libya, a place I know well. People have talked about the fragmentation of Libya, but 
The important thing to remember is that in a lot of these states, even though the borders may have been cobbled together during the colonial period or perhaps earlier during the Ottoman times, what happens in that, in that period is that identities do form. I mean, people do have attachments. States set up um, armies. They set up uh, administration. Um, and so I think there's, there's a greater de degree of durability um, than, than we often assume. Um, even in a place like Lebanon, for instance, people have often asked me, um, and we have some, some real experts at Carnegie are in, are in Lebanon, we have, I mean, we have an office there, um, so I defer to a lot of their expertise, but this notion that will the Syria conflict spill over into Lebanon and ignite Lebanon's sex and ignite civil war into Lebanon, again, that's, this is the, the quintessential artificial state in the region, the answer from a lot of people who know it is no. People remember the Civil War and they don't want to go down that road again. Even an actor like Hezbollah recognizes that it's not in its interest to go down that path again. So you have scattered instances of sectarian fighting in the North and Tripoli, but by and large the state is, is maintaining its coherence. A key factor is the army. You, have the, you had the development of the army since the, um, since the Civil War that has been, for all accounts, fairly professional. So these states that were artificial, where identity is weak, they've, they've set up institutions, they've been able to govern. That's not to say that there aren't areas that are weak. Again, um, Western Iraq, Eastern Syria, um, these sort of no-go zones, I mean, Eastern Libya, where I was. The Sinai is a huge, obviously a huge concern. So again, we're talking about pockets of, of misgovernance, pockets of ungovernments. Ungovernance, but again, I think the states are more durable than, than we would assume. Can, can I yeah. pile on there yeah. on yeah. Lebanon? I mean, the 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 horror scenario is not that you have sort of spontaneous ignition again between right. the sex, but rather that uh, uh, forces who are fighting in Syria uh, do the kinds of things they've been doing, which is blowing up big bombs in Beirut, uh, you know, in uh, in the Hezbollah quarter. Uh, or they start, you know, killing senior officials, which they've also been doing. Yeah, no, it's and right. of course, the, the Saudis have offered a lot of money to the Lebanese army. Yes, which right. is an interesting way to uh, extend um, foreign aid. Um, you know, just they don't <laughs> go through the government; they just offer the army the right, money. Right. Um, so there is the possibility of actual spillover. I agree with you. I agree. With you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but we're t I was talking about the, I mean, the dissolution, or you know, I mean, you know, yeah. I think you're having a tit for tat, but. Um, the army is an interesting case because I think here again the Saudi, the, the, the Lebanese army does have quite a bit of penetration by Hezbollah. I mean, it's, it's intelligence apparatus, it's seen as somewhat sympathetic to Hezbollah. Um, so again, the Saudi move toward the Lebanese army could also be, I think, sending a blow to, to Iran, sending a signal also to the United States because historically we've We've backed the, um, the Lebanese army. My sense is that's going to take a long time to take uh, effect, I mean, to actually come into play. And it's, I think, more of a, almost a, a symbolic gesture. But you're right. I mean, it is an effort by the Saudis to, to solidify the, um, the Lebanese state. So. Hi. Um, you talked about peeling back layers. Right. Uh, and maybe... I'd like to try to peel back one more. Sure. Um, you talked at the beginning about uh, views from the Gulf of the sectarian divide, and then right. you brought in a little of the United States right. writers. Um, I'm thinking that we see this thinking um, throughout the world, not just in the Middle East. Right. But it, we see Americans in general seeing Afghanistan as fraught by these deep historical divides. Yeah, yeah. We saw this in the Balkans. Right. And we see it at times in Africa, Somalia, and West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Yeah. Um, what are some of the reasons? I can think of a couple, maybe our history, uh, our history of isolationist, mm -hmm. the concept of the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why, why do we think in these terms when, when we are confronted by complex political situations? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a huge, huge question. I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, it stems from our, our apartness, I guess, from, from sort of, you know, that maybe it's part of our founding myth that we were established as a country that was meant to move us away from old world sectarian strife, if you will, I mean, between, you know, the old world, the old countries, Protestants, Catholics, I mean, that we have this vision of ourselves that we're somehow apart from that, and when we see what's beyond our borders, it's, it's a strange and an ugly place, there are these identities, this cauldron, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a way of, of making sense of things. What, what you find, and, and I think, you know, you talk to good anthropologists, you talk to people that live in the region, that study it, is that what appears to be ancient and unchanging is actually very dynamic and modern in some cases. Um, so, so again, the Balkan case is, is very interesting. There was this um, very interesting book called Balkan Ghosts by Robert Kaplan that, that came right around the time of, the, of our intervention in, in Bosnia. And, and it was taken, I think, a sort of gospel that, oh my God, these Serbs and Croats have always been at each other's throats and we're wading into this quagmire. But a lot of serious scholars of the Balkans took, you know, criticized that book because it, it ignored the way, the modernity of these identities, the fact that identities had been, been manipulated and in some cases inflated by rulers and that what appears to be ancient to us is actually quite modern and, and artificial in some cases. Case in point, when I went to Iraq as a, as a young military officer in 2003, Saddam had just fallen. Country's in chaos. The, you know, CPA, has, we dismissed the bath, we've purged the bath out, the army's disintegrated. People are trying to look at sources of authority. How do you govern this country? And we started looking at the tribes because we said the tribes are real sources of power in this country. They're authentic. These are authentic, you know, this is organic. This is what people believe. And this was a mistake because what had happened is in the last period of Saddam's rule, Saddam had empowered the tribes. He had artificially in inflated the tribes. So you had tribes coming up to us in the US military saying, I'm a tribal leader. My tribe has been in power in this area for centuries, going back to whatever, Muhammad's time. I've always been here. And that wasn't the case. That tribe was put in power and inflated by Saddam. That was a deliberate policy. So again, identities can be resurrected. They can be manipulated. So I would look at, you know, look at the region in terms of politics that are just like ours in many respects. And identities, you know, we have identities in this country. And again, politics is often, I think, sort of, um, you know, there's real politics in this region. There's not just identities, is my, is my point. So, so um, maybe I'll just take this opportunity, since we have just a few more minutes, to ask you to give us uh, um, your view of uh, the direction uh, that events are going in in Libya, because that's your other yeah, uh, yeah. great focus. And, um, sure. and uh, we haven't had enough gloom here, so uh, <laughs> why don't you uh, have yeah. that? Well, again, I was, I've been visiting Libya since before the revolution, and, and you know, I, I have a lot of friends in Libya, and, and I can't tell you that, you know, Qaddafi's rule was, was really an Orwellian dictatorship, 42 years of trauma, 42 years of personality cult. People had no experience governing themselves. I mean, this was a dictator that completely obliterated civil society notions of governance. So in many respects, Libya is starting from scratch. There are simply no institutions in the country. This was, a, this was one man rule. They're learning it all fresh. This has tremendous pitfalls. This carries tremendous challenges. It's gonna result in a lot of growing pains. But on a glimmer of optimism, I think it's cause for, for some optimism because you don't have, for instance, like you do in Egypt, a military that can ob obstruct the transition to democracy. I mean, you do have in Libya this sense of people pulling together, um, that you know, Libyans are committed to the integrity of their country, the territorial integrity. Certainly you have the militia problem. I mean, this is the fundamental problem. The fact that this was a revolution from the ground up, there wasn't a single military organization that was able to, to corral different forces, uh, that was able to lead the revolution. So you had spontaneous armed groups all over the country rising up. Those militias are now ruling the country, and they haven't been able to disarm, they haven't been able to form a government. Um, 
obviously there's tremendous questions about the Constitution. There's real questions about the sharing of oil wealth. I'm really concerned that Iran, you know, that uh, Libya could go down the path of another depressing oil autocracy if that wealth is not managed. You do have a movement in the eastern part of the country toward greater autonomy. They're trying to use the oil. So again, a lot of worrisome, worrisome signs on the horizon for this country. But again, going back to my talk, there's no sectarianism. There's no fundamental, real ethnic divides in this country. It's a small population concentrated along the coast, relatively homogeneous. You do have Berbers, you have Toreg, um, you do have some murmurs of ethnic irredentism, but by and large, you don't have these sharp sectarian divides or ethnic divides like you do with the Kurds in Iraq. And what's also interesting, going back to sort of IR theory and, and you know, international politics, you don't have neighbors that are actively meddling in Libya and, and trying to meddle and back different factions. Um, so again, I think this is, this is grounds for optimism. When you, I mean, there is obviously murmurings and there's a, there's a significant Islamic radical presence. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic uh, Maghreb is making inroads there. I've argued in a lot of writings, we need to step in um, with greater support. We're helping the Libyans build their army, but we've got to do it in the right way. Um, so I'm, I'm actually in contact with a lot of people about how we help them uh, build their army and, and establish a strong, uh, stronger state. So, Any questions? Okay, well, uh, Fred, thanks so much yeah, for coming. No problem, actually, yeah. <clears throat> At least there's one small corner of the map in America that is starting to understand what sectarianism <laughs> I guess, yeah. is, and I really want to thank you for being here today, and thank you all for coming.